Hello folks, welcome back. I think we are at part six of our standard electric time project. I've uh, managed to milk this one for quite a while, but we're going to finish up today here. This is a slave clock. This is the last piece of the master clock. The function of the master clock was to run the rest of the clocks in the building and run the bells. So this is a slave clock. This would have been installed in every classroom or various places in a factory, that kind of thing. And we're going to talk about how they work and what we uh, need to do to get them to run. So this is a standard electric time clock. This did not come from the same place as my standard electric time master clock, but it is the same brand. And if we look at the back of this, it's got this sealed can in the middle and it's got a couple terminals and it has one of these resistors that you may recognize from looking at the master clock. This does not have a conventional clock escapement. How a slave clock works, it's essentially a ratchet. So if we provide a pulse at the terminals here, that will cause a solenoid inside the movement here to ratchet the mechanism forward one minute. And what's great about this is the timekeeping is all done at the master clock back in the furnace room or the school office or wherever the master clock lives. And every clock in your facility then receives the same pulse at the same time. So unless something breaks, all of the clocks will show exactly the same time. Here's our clock laboratory. I have a DC power supply. I have a digital multimeter and I have our slave clock. And the way that I have this wired up is I've got the outputs of the power supply. The negative of this is connected to one of the terminals of the slave clock. And the positive terminal of the power supply runs over to our digital multimeter on the current range, and then it returns from the multimeter to the other side of the clock. So when you approach an unknown electric clock like this, you always want to be really conservative so that you're not sending it more power than it can handle because you might fry one of the solenoids in the clock and be in big trouble. So with a supply like this, what we can do is we can start with a really low voltage and see what happens and see when we can get some action. So the way that this power supply works is, and it's a little difficult to see, but I think you can see at the top here, I can set a voltage and a current limit. So what I'm going to do just for the sake of not blowing up my um, clock, I'm going to set my current limit to be at, we'll call it 400 milliamps or 0 0.4 amps. I think that would be a low enough value that uh, it would prevent any wiring to, from uh, burning up in the solenoid if something happens. I'm going to go back over here to voltage mode, and again, I don't know what this is going to need, so I, you know, we'll start it real small. At, we'll start it at 5 volts. And so what should happen is we'll see the voltage show up on the graph here when I turn it on, and we may see some current reading here. Um, and hopefully we'll see the clock actually move. So we're starting out, I don't know what the, the uh, operating voltage of this clock is, so we're starting conservatively. I'm gonna just turn it on for a second, and what's supposed to happen is the second hand, or sorry, the minute hand is supposed to advance one minute per pulse. So I'm gonna turn my power supply on just for a second, and then I'm gonna turn it off because it needs to be a pulse rather than uh, sustained current. Here we go, on off okay I did not see any movement on our minute hand if we look at our current meter let's see what we can see all right we've got about four milliamps but that doesn't seem to be enough to do anything so i'm going to just carefully increase my voltage a little bit right now we're at eight volts so i'll turn this on again we'll watch the minute hand and we'll note the current value on the meter do that again so now we're reading about seven milliamps on the meter, but still no movement on our minute hand. So we'll go a little higher. Right now we're at 10 volts on our power supply. We'll turn that on and see what happens. Okay, there we go. We had our minute hand move. It, it, um, it recoiled just a little bit backward and then it jumped ahead the minute. I'll run that again here. It goes back and when I turn the power off, is when it actually advances. So when the pulse is applied, it 
Um, it charges the solenoid, which winds up the, uh, the ratchet mechanism. And then when the power is removed and the solenoid releases, a spring is what actually advances the minute. And if we look at our current meter here, we can see what's happening. During the pulse, right now we have about nine milliamps being drawn. Uh, right now we're at 10 volts. 10 volts is kind of a weird number. Uh, I suspect this is probably a 12 volt clock. So I've set the power supply here now to 12 volts and we'll see what happens. What I mainly want is I want the clock to advance reliably and it seems to be doing that. I can put a voltage higher than this into the clock within some reasonable margin and probably be okay. But this appears to be a 12 volt slave clock. Now, my uh, master clock, I believe, is actually a 24 volt master clock. And the bell that I showed in an earlier video seems to run on about four volts. And so, again, I collected these pieces from various different places and it's likely that if you bought a clock uh, and the slave clock from the same place, they would be the same voltage. And actually my master clock had the, uh, the bell bus wired together with the clock power. So I do believe it was intended to all be the same voltage. But because of the way the master clock is set up where everything external to the clock is through a set of relay contacts, we can actually accommodate this. I can have a 12, uh, 24 volt supply for the master clock, and then we can provide a separate 12 volt supply for the slave and actually a separate four or five volt supply for the bell mechanism. And the master clock will handle that just fine. So let's get this apart. We'll see what's inside. I wrestled the can off the clock and this is what we have. Looks like there's some corrosion from somewhere on the coil. I think this is just on the surface, so I'm not that worried about it. I don't know where that came from. If there was some water damage or something, it looks like this pivot right here is a little green too, but that's that's kind of strange. I don't understand where that came from. But there's really not much here. So we have our two input leads and those attach to our two coil terminals right here. The coil pulls on this lever and you can see that raises our ratchet mechanism. And then there's a spring right here, a little wire spring show that better there it is and that returns the solenoid lever to its original place so we advance one tooth at a time there's a little pin on the main ratcheting lever that acts as a stop to this top click spring wheel and then the ratchet mechanism drives the lower wheel into the time train of the clock so there's really very little to this. I'll go ahead and pulse this a couple times so we can see it in action here. Okay, when I apply power, it pulls the relay closed and then that raises our ratchet. And when I release the power, that falls back into place powered by the return spring, which is this wire right here. And that's the basic operation of a slave clock. This one seems to be in good working order. I am gonna take it apart and do a quick oil job. One thing that was interesting is this whole clock operates on about 10 milliamps, which is, you know, a 20th of the power of the slave clock, the master clock needs. So uh, I don't think there's really a lot of force on this mechanism. Uh, mainly force in clocks happens because of a huge gear ratio where you need to wind a clock um, a dozen or so times, but then it needs to run for a week. Uh, this clock doesn't do that. Basically, the, the gear ratio is, is really uh, not that high because you're driving this just once per minute. And the only thing you need to do is you need to gear the minute hand down to be uh, driving the hour hand. So I, I don't think I'm going to need to do any wear compensation, any bushings on this. We'll just take it apart, clean it up, oil it, put it back together. Here's the mechanism out of the clock can just by removing these four screws. Looking at this, the hour hand is kind of rusty. I think I'm gonna sand that off, uh, sand both of these hands and repaint them so that they look a little sharper. Uh, this is gonna come apart like a regular mechanical clock. We just pull out the taper pin here and the hands are gonna come off. And then there is a screw underneath that. 
that will let us get the dial off. Off comes our dial and here are the three main movement mounting screws. Back bezel comes off. And here's our movement. All right, we're mostly disassembled. Uh, the coil on this clock is riveted on, and it looks like there's some kind of double-faced adhesive here. Uh, there's only one pivot that really matters, and this is where the hour hand shaft is, and then I just clean the outside of this. So I'm going to not put this through the ultrasonic cleaner. That would be disastrous for the lacquer on the windings. I am going to throw the main drivetrain in. Again, this is a pretty low wear part, uh, a conventional clock ticks at a, a, very min a bare minimum of 60 times a second and often quite a bit more than that. There are some kitchen clocks that are 150 times a second. This is once a minute. So this gear train is not made as precisely. We don't have any brass. This is all steel. So it's just a lot simpler technical problem and therefore it doesn't really have to be quite as clean as a mechanical clock with a, a conventional train. But we'll throw it through, clean it up and then put it back together. We are through the ultrasonic cleaner. I did end up putting one bushing in here that was a little bit of slop. Uh, not a lot to talk about, really. There, there's just not that much to this mechanism. So it went together very easily, just uh, keeping track of where the springs are. But we did have a casualty. We lost one of our leads. And so we need to re-solder this. Um, you can see the connection right there where the wire broke. So we'll take care of that now, and then this can go back together. I've got the movement mostly reassembled now. The hands, I think, turned out pretty nice. That's a couple coats of black spray paint and a couple coats of lacquer. I think there's just a nice sheen on them and a good finish, so those turned out really nice. I'm very happy about that. Well, one note about putting the hands back on a slave clock like this is normally you have a clutch that lets you uh, adjust the minute hand uh, quickly. In this case, it's actually all locked in with hard gearing. So to figure out where the hands need to go, you actually need to advance the movement using the solenoid so that you can set it where you need it to be. But uh, that was no problem. Uh, looks like things are just working fantastic. I was able to repair the broken wire on the solenoid and uh, got that all back together. So we're gonna throw it in the clock and we'll power it with the master and see if we can get the whole thing to work. The slave clock is wired in I want to just take you to the top of the clock and show you how I'm powering it with the terminals that my clock has. I showed you the terminal block for my clock in perhaps the first or second video. And just to do a little refresher here, this one on the left is the negative bus. This guy here is the one of the terminals for the bell zones. Uh, actually, don't recall what that is off the top of my head. This is the positive supply for uh, the clock movement and also uh, the, the slave clock. And over here we have 1C. This is the, uh, the switched contact for the slave clock. And then we have bells 1, 2, 3, and 4. So I've got my negative terminal here. And that actually is what is connected to the other side of the clock solenoid in the um, in the machine so the positive to the slave clock comes off of the positive bus and the negative of the slave clock is attached through the the relay here back to the negative terminal so it's a little bit odd to switch on the the return leg but that's how they did it and once again this is triggered off of the contact from the escape wheel that's coming up right now at about the nine o'clock position so that will go around and it will contact what we can see going in and out at three o'clock and when that contact comes around it will send power to the slave clock and it will advance one minute 
So we'll watch for that. We got about 10 seconds before that contact's gonna come around and we should see this fire. Here we go. And there it is, pretty cool. One of the maintenance items of a clock like this is synchronizing the three timing systems. You can see that the master clock itself says about 926. The slave clock says 145 and the punch tape says 325. So how do you get all of these to line up so that it makes sense? Um, to adjust the tape, we can hold down our minute wheel and we can actually advance this rapidly to make it match our master clock. But how do you get the slave clocks to match? Well, there is actually a button at the bottom of the clock, which is what you can press to manually advance the slave. I'll just push that here. And so you can do this, the contact's a little dirty, but you can do that to uh, uh, update the time on the slave clocks without uh, running the master. If you have a long time adjustment to make, if, if the power was out for hours and you're, you're all out of whack, you can also actually turn the clocks off with this switch and that will prevent the slave clocks from firing when the master does. And essentially you could let this clock run until it was in the vicinity of where the slave clocks were and then you would just flip that switch on to turn the slaves back up. So uh, this does take a little bit of maintenance. Some of these clocks actually had a pilot clock right in here that would be essentially a small version of the slave mounted in the clock case so that you could easily see what was needed to get your clock system running. This clock doesn't have that, so I suspect they just mounted a full-size uh, slave in the vicinity of the master. So this concludes our work on our standard electric time here. This has been a fun project and I sure appreciate you sticking with me for multiple parts of this video. It's my longest series to date. Uh, I may try to do one more just high level, how does the clock work series so that people don't have to sit through three hours of videos going through every nuance. But uh, anyway, it's been very fun to get this running. It's been fun to get the, uh, all of this, the steps of the clock functioning, the, uh, the bell, the slave, the, the tape mechanism, and uh, reverse engineer how the wiring diagram worked out. So thanks again for watching.